So here we are at uh, just before lunch on launch day in February, uh, feeling good because the tank was tanked up. We knew the cutoff sensors were working, so we uh, could uh, have our weather brief to see that the weather was looking reasonable and uh, go in and put on our pressure suits to get ready for launch. Uh, we go in, and this is in crew quarters in quarantine at the Kennedy Space Center. We put the suit on, we button it up, we pressurize it and make sure it's uh, airtight so if we need it on ascent, it'll work. Uh, it's also uh, one of our last chances to kind of relax before we uh, head out for the launch count. We were also lucky enough to take uh, General Eihartz up with us uh, to begin his stay on the International Space Station, which he just returned from a few days ago. And once we're all set, we uh, walk out of crew quarters here and had a chance to, uh, to wave to so many of the folks that had gotten Atlantis ready to fly. We head straight out to the pad uh, and right up to the 195-foot uh, level on the pad to start strapping into Atlantis. Uh, we kind of go in in order, in seat order. This is uh, me strapping in on the left side. This is about three hours before launch. Here's Dex uh, strapping in on the right side. Uh, we go in first, and then on the flight deck, you can see Leland back there is all strapped in, and they're getting ready to uh, put uh, Rex in his seat. You can see the, uh, the, the pad folks, the suit techs, and uh, astronaut support personnel work really hard to get us in our seats. This is down on the mid-deck now. You can see Leo getting in, and then there's Hans going over on the MS-3 spot over closest to the hatch. Once he's in, Stan goes in, uh, and Stan's going in at the same time as Leland and Rex on the flight deck. Just a few minutes before launch here, we're ready to go. We're excited. We heard that the weather's good, and I'll just let you listen to the launch here for a Main few safety seconds. systems arm. Down suppression system, water activated. Um, See the orbiter gets off the pad uh, quickly and it's as exciting inside as it looks from the outside. Uh, we quickly accelerate going through the sound barrier. You can see the shock waves here uh, right there as they go through the camera view. After just two minutes, we've used up the solid rocket boosters. We uh, jettison them. Then here's a great view of Atlantis from that camera off that solid rocket booster pushing away. A minute or so later, we're up to about 10,000 miles an hour. We roll heads up and you have a view of the Atlantic there in the background as we go up the east coast of the United States. Eight and a half minutes, and uh, we've gotten to the speed we need. We shut down the engines and jettison the external tank. Uh, you'll see it come off here in just a second, and the reaction control jets on the orbiter push us away and uh, get us safely clear. We do a small burn and uh, push out in front so we can get some pictures of it. Uh, the glow you see is actually just the plasma around the orbiter since we're going 17,000 miles an hour, and we're still in just a little bit of the atmosphere here as we climb away. Uh, right as soon as the engines uh, shut down, both Leland and on the flight deck and Hans in the mid-deck start unstrapping to be able to take uh, video and still pictures of the orbiter. And there's some video Leland shot uh, at the same time Hans was shooting high-resolution still images. That's uh, the last propellant venting out of the external tank as it heads for the Indian Ocean. Once safely on orbit, we start the job of converting the shuttle from a rocket ship into a spacecraft. An important part of that is getting the payload bay doors open. Once the doors are open, we can activate the shuttle's robotic arm, which we're going to use on flight day two, the first full day in orbit, to grapple an inspection boom that we carried up on the side of the payload bay. And with it, we're going to scan all of the areas of the orbiter that see high temperatures on entry to make sure that the heat shield didn't sustain any damage. That's a sped up view of uh, the, of the boom maneuvering. This is a view out of one of the sensors on the end of that inspection boom as we sweep it across the orbiter, looking to make sure we didn't sustain any damage during launch. And there's a view out that camera looking at Hans, who's looking out the hatch window, <laughs> making sure we're flying the arm correctly. Also on flight day two, we began preparing for the first of our EVAs on space station. This is filling up the drink bags that we're going to use in the spacesuits. Uh, flight day three is rendezvous day. And we start off the day about 40 miles behind the station, getting into the rendezvous checklist. Use the laptop computers and lots of other rendezvous tools to, and a series of burns to get us below the station. Here we are crossing the coast of Peru, just south of Lima, and uh, getting ready to start the rendezvous pitch maneuver, which is a maneuver that allows the station crew to image the underside of the orbiter for any thermal protection system damage. Steve's at the controls here. And once this is complete, we fly out in front of the station down to, out to a distance of about 300 feet 
and come down the velocity vector of the space station. This is a view of the uh, space station rising in the aft window of the uh, flight deck during the uh, rendezvous pitch maneuver. And we, show, we see Rex uh, using the handheld laser to measure range and range rate as we're approaching the station at an incredible speed of about one-tenth of a foot per second. <laughs> the uh, video here shows Steve uh, at the controls and the closure rate that we actually see. In a moment here, we'll speed this up, and you can see the docking systems coming together. Steve is controlling the uh, orbiter to a tolerance of about three inches on these two huge vehicles traveling at 17,000 miles per hour. We get contact and capture of the space station, and uh, congratulations on a job well done to the commander for just a great job of flying. We got the hatches open, and uh, flight day three was also Peggy's birthday. We brought her a big module for her birthday present. <laughs> the uh, inside of node two is a big, beautiful, bright place. And you can see after a couple of days of being trapped uh, on the small confines of the space shuttle, we're happy to have a lot of extra room to move around in, but also a bit clumsy as well. <laughs> it takes a, a few days to figure out how to move around in such a large volume. But we were happy to see Dan and uh, happy to have him become part of our crew and really happy to have the chance to bring him home. And then on the uh, first night we had on the space station, uh, Peggy and her crew were uh, nice enough to invite us over to the service module to have dinner over there, and they brought out the best Russian food they had, and it was, uh, it was very good, very tasty. Gave us a chance to uh, relax a little bit and see our old friends and uh, have time off before we got into the work of getting to do some spacewalks. Here we're briefing the day before we go on our spacewalk, and then you see here the day of the morning of the spacewalks, we got our suits on, and uh, Peggy and, and Steve are getting us ready to go into the airlock, and here's Stan getting uh, guided into the airlock very carefully. Then they close the hatch of the airlock, and we can uh, get all the air out of there and then open the door and go outside and work. And here you see a picture when I opened the hatch for the first time on the first spacewalk, and right below me is the Swiss Alps. It was just a spectacular sight. And, uh, had a chance to look for a few seconds, and then it was uh, going outside and uh, get to work. Our first job on the first spacewalk was to prepare Columbus so that it could be pulled out of the payload bay and then attached to the space station. We used these high-tech power tools here to tighten and loosen bolts. And then here's a picture of Stan grabbing a, what's called the grapple fixture that we're going to put onto Columbus, and that'll allow the robot arm to grab Columbus and pull it out of the payload bay. So that's Stan upside down hanging on the grapple fixture. And then here he is putting it onto Columbus and gets it seated well. And then we use our power tools to, to bolt it on there real tight. Now to get access to that uh, grapple fixture, we had to take some panels off of Columbus. And here you'll see us see Stan in the background putting the, one of those panels back on while I'm working uh, there in the foreground. And here you see a, a view of it from our helmet cameras. We have cameras on the top of our helmets, and here we're going over Cape Cod. You can see down there in the distance. And we also have helmet lights. You can see Hans here as he's working outside at night. The helmet lights light up his workspace so we can continue working uh, all the time we're going around the, uh, going around the Earth. You also have sun visors and when it's sunny at day daytime, and then you can put them up when your friends say, hey, look at me. And so uh, <laughs> get to wave to them at the, uh, into the, in the shuttle and take a picture. The second spacewalk, we were changing out a nitrogen tank that was empty on the space station. Here we're unwrapping the brand new one in the payload bay, and then I'm getting a nice ride with the new uh, nitrogen tank, and they're going to drive me up to the uh, space station so I can install it. And it's a great ride on the robot arm. They drive you really smoothly and take you right to where you need to go. And then here, Hans and I are installing it into the uh, space station, nice and snug and tight. Now, while we're outside there, we don't have our checklist for each step that we're going to do. So Dex here is inside reading the checklist and telling us each step we need to do so we stay on the timeline and work it real well. These reflections here are one of the reasons why we call Columbus our shiny module. And we have to do a lot of equipment out there, uh, thermal protective covers, handrails. Uh, it took us EVA2 and EVA3 to do that. Uh, it's... Uh, the favorite pastime of an eva -er once he has a couple seconds just to enjoy the view to Earth. And uh, on EVA-3, we had external payloads to be attached to Columbus, and inside the robotic 
operators with a robotic arm outside helped us to do that. Here you see Stan carrying solar, a solar observatory, to the starboard side of Columbus. And at the end, or in the middle of that EVA, he installed UTEF, European Technolo uh, Technology uh, Exposure Facility. Uh, and uh, not, not only that he put it there and put UTEF, the second one, on, uh, he also retrieved, together with Rex, of course, a uh, gyroscope which has failed earlier on board, and we are bringing it back down to ground to fix it and reuse it. Uh, the end of the EVA, of course, is entering the airlock again and join our crew inside. Stan had attached the grapple fixture earlier, which allowed me to come down and grapple Columbus. This was our major mission objective, and we're going to, working with Dan Tani and uh, Leo Earhart's in the robotic workstation, we're able to move the Columbus module out of the payload bay. Now, this was sped up. It was really going very, very slowly, but we could look at monitors and look at the cameras and use that to maneuver this big module, this research laboratory, out of the bay and attach it to the space station. We're now moving it to the right of the shuttle, and we're configuring it. This is a view out of the aft window the guys were looking at as we were installing it. And now we're reconfiguring the arm to allow it to line up perfectly so we can pull it in to node two. So that's a lot of reconfiguration. And now here we go. We're going into the uh, node two to berth it. A little more motion. We're getting there. Beautiful views of the ground as we go by. One little more snug, and we're there. Columbus install. Once it's installed, we have inside, of course, also outfitting activities to do. And uh, once we are in the lab, uh, we have to remove a lot of launch locks. We see here Dan and, uh, and Leo to install the panel, and uh, Steve here to work on a handrail, or better say, footrail. Uh, myself working now at an experiment level, uh, removing launch locks of Biolabor. And uh, one of the favorite uh, also pastimes, uh, semi-pastime activity is taking pictures. And I don't need to comment that it's a Caribbean. It's, uh, it's just breathtaking. And uh, it's important for us to get a good night's sleep. And here is Dan Tanny doing uh, just that. It's Rex. He uses some eye covers. Uh, we all are very relaxed and get a good night's sleep. Uh, mine is shortly interrupted, as you see. <laughs> and we have here Dex uh, completely relaxed. And uh, the last one, most important and most relaxed crew member, is our commander. <laughs> we had completed our work at the space station, and uh, it was a bittersweet time. We had to say goodbye to the station crew and leave Leo up with Peggy and Yuri and bring Dan with us. So I'm at the controls on the aft flight deck, and we're... Uh, Undocking, the guys on the ground did a great job in preserving enough propellant consumables for us to be able to do a 360-degree fly around of the station for some photo documentation purposes. And it was a beautiful day, and we got some great views of Columbus with both external payloads and all the equipment attached. Space Station uh, is just an absolutely incredible site, and it's very, very large. Uh, and it's just uh, breathtaking to see it flying uh, with the earth in the background. And there's a view of Dan leaving his home in space and headed back to the house. OK, Rex is supposed to be exercising here, but uh, <laughs> I really don't know what he's doing, but he's about to spin out of control. And uh, Rex, watch your head there. <laughs> we were playing m and croquet with water bubbles. And here, Stan is in his mid-deck locker, pulling out clothing and looking where his personal items are stored. We all use those lockers to store all of our equipment. Rex is brushing his teeth, got to keep your teeth clean in space. <laughs> and here we all are, looking out the window, about to come home. We're very excited about coming home to see our families. One of the last moments we want to have in space, and uh, everyone's waving. And uh, you see Steve up in the front window taking pictures. A great time. After all the fun and camaraderie, it's time for the serious business of getting ready to return to Earth. Here is Steve uh, practicing with the shuttle landing simulator that runs on one of our laptop computers. On entry day, we suit up in our orange suits, the same ones we wore for launch. Only this time, there's no ground crew to help us, so we have to do it all ourselves. This is me helping to strap in the crew on the flight deck as they get ready now to do the deorbit burn. 
which is a small adjustment to our orbit, which will bring us skimming into the Earth's atmosphere, where we'll begin bleeding off the enormous speed that we got while all those rockets were burning during launch. They'll bring the shuttle speed down to a reasonable 200 knots for landing. This is a view out the overhead windows. What you're seeing there, that pulsing flame, is our several hundred mile long plasma trail that comes out behind the shuttle as we're entering the atmosphere and bleeding off all that speed. Okay, so with those uh, twin sonic booms that they always hear at the Kennedy Space Center when Orbiter was coming home, uh, we're headed back. The weather was beautiful at Florida, just a high cloud deck here, which you'll see will pop through this cloud deck. And uh, as soon as we come out of it, the runway will be right there in front of us, right where it's supposed to be. Uh, it was uh, Dex and I had done these kind of approaches between the two of us a couple thousand times, and it was great to see that the orbiter flew just like our uh, our practiced uh, vehicles. Uh, Dex was talking me down through this uh, the whole time, telling me where I was, where I needed to go, and the orbiter was flying great. Uh, if you're looking in the pilot's view on the left, uh, we it was nice to know that our families were right there on the left side of the runway watching us as we went by, and uh, they said they could see us in the windows as we were coming into land. Coming into touchdown on runway 15 at the Kennedy Space Center, uh, this was a, a great relief uh, right about now. We knew we had it down safely, just a few more procedures to do, get the drag chute out, get it slowed down and stopped uh, on center line, hopefully, eventually. And uh, then we just have a few procedures to do at the end, uh, and then we can climb out of the vehicle, uh, relax, get our pressure suits off, uh, try to get used to the ground a little bit, get our flight suits on, and then, then come on out and uh, say hi to some folks who uh, were there waiting for us to welcome us home. A lot, of, a lot of people that had helped to get Atlantis ready and that were happy to have it back so they could get it ready for the Hubble mission this fall. Something that was great for us was that we've been kind of trapped inside for 13 days and it's really neat to get outside and look at the parts of Atlantis we hadn't seen when we were up there. Looked at the whole thermal protection system, the tiles, the RCC, uh, and it looked just as good as when we launched. Uh, Dex and I get to look at uh, where I landed. I did not land there, but that's where we ended up, which was nice. One last chance to get some pictures together, but what we really wanted to do was get on the van and head back to crew quarters because that's where our family was waiting for us. We hadn't seen it for two weeks and we couldn't wait to uh, give a big hug and uh, be glad to be home. <laughs>